the, the Career Firefighter of the Year award we do this time of year and um, is voted on by the entire paid staff, with the exception of myself. And uh, there was an overwhelming support of our career firefighter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you do a really good job, man. You, you know, it's a positive attitude. You're a hard worker, and I'm hoping you're going to be a role model to others throughout the <coughs> shift. If you know what I mean. <laughs> but uh, I'm sure you already know. But Hodge, we certainly appreciate everything you've done, and we'd like to present you with your career firefighter of the year too. I think it's only fitting that you say a few words. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a few words. Uh, I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> you know it. Did you get, hey, did you get all that out? <laughs> it took me longer to follow the survey than that. Make sure you trim all the fat out of that state. All right. The fire service is is truly made up of brothers and sisters and brothers and sisters it's the same as a family where brothers and sisters fight all the time but if if someone else comes into your house you'll fight for each other and that's what happens on a fire scene um, they, they're all brothers and sisters and they do their own job and they look after each other too so what i would say is when when you're when you're looking at the organization and what they really do when there is an emergency it is it is a paramilitary orchestrated chaos and the Garner Fire Department is one of the most aggressive and well-trained departments when it comes to firefighting that there is today. Every now and then we get the, the opportunity from a homeowner or property owner, they have a structure that they need torn down or removed and they contact the fire department and see if we're interested in burning the house down for training. So it's a wonderful opportunity for us to get live fire training, uh, which is a little different than when we go to a fire training center and it's simulated fire. As what you see behind us, this is a, a real live structure uh, that we would respond to on any given day. Um, so we come out here and uh, put together this training exercise and we start out by lighting small fires in different rooms. And we take crews in and this is just some of the best training that the fire service can provide to firefighters whether they're new or they've been in the fire service for years. Um, so this is, uh, this is some rare training, we don't get to do this much. Uh, so we certainly jump on this opportunity when someone has a piece of property that they want demolished or burned down. There's certain criteria that the house has to meet structurally. Like it has to go through an asbestos test. It has to be structurally sound. Um, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, you see, you'll see walking around that there's a couple holes cut in the house. Um, we have to have certain, certain access points to the house so nobody gets hurt. It's all, it's all safety issues to ensure that everybody out here is safe while we're training. I think it's a great tool for younger firefighters, but I think it's also a great tool for everybody to, you know, to get in these live conditions. You learn something new each time, whether it's the way the fire behaves, to whether the way you need to uh, place the line, use the nozzle. I mean, it, really, you get a little bit of everything. So. Typically on live burns, we will, we will set a goal to get as many live uh, training evolutions as we need to. And then after that, we back everybody out. We, everybody understands we're going to what we call burn down. And we go in and load the house, get it ready. We light the fire. Nobody goes back in. It's all exterior, just keeping it contained and letting it burn slowly down.
So um, one, one tool that is the lifeline of a firefighter on a fire is, is the SCBA. It's called, it's a, it is an SCBA, it's a self-contained breathing apparatus. Uh, in layman's terms, it's an air pack. It is a tank of, of air. There's a misconception that it's oxygen. It's not oxygen, it's just it's normal atmospheric air. And it, it usually, it, it holds approximately 30 minutes worth of normal breathing time air. However, when a firefighter goes into a fire, wearing the, the equipment they're wearing and doing the job, uh, obviously their respiratory rate increases, so uh, uh, those air bottles only during the last 15 to 20 minutes. But they are crucial to a firefighter's safety. Uh, everything in a normal house today is a hydrocarbon, which is, in chemical terms, is the same property as gasoline or, or diesel fuel, and you cannot bring those vapors. Generally, when a firefighter goes through two of those bottles, then we'll bring that firefighter out and give them a break because that, that's, that's a, a time frame that lets us know we need to check their vital signs uh, and rehydrate them because they've been performing those uh, very physically constringent duties for at least an hour. Physical fitness for firefighters is extremely important. Uh, the number one killer for firefighters are cardiovascular incidents and also strokes. Um, our job is very stressful, not only mentally, but physically. We put our guys in some very rough environments, whether it's high heat, whether it's carrying heavy equipment, whether it's just operating with your, your uh, protective equipment on, which is very hev heavy and, and, and warm as well. Um, all these things change your body, raise your core temperature, and then you're you're working to the point of exhaustion. So if you're not physically fit before you do the firefighting duties, you're just putting yourself at a very high risk uh, for cardiac arrest or stroke. Um, what we do is not easy. Uh, it takes a physically fit person to not only pick up, move, whether we're talking hoses, equipment, holding the jaws of life that weigh 60 pounds, trying to cut somebody out of a car, but just the physical act of entering a burning structure um, it's going to raise your temperature of your body and do things to your body. So physical fitness is certainly key to being a firefighter. Approximately 100 firefighters each year die in the United States. North Carolina has one of the highest fatality rates of firefighters in the United States. And predominantly it's not due to uh, dying in a fire. It's due to cardiac arrests, um, heart attacks, and things like that. So physical fitness is very important in the well-being of a firefighter. So that we stress uh, that they PT or train physically at least one hour per day while they're here. We have an annual physical assessment where we assess each firefighter um, with a, a minimum standard of physical fitness challenges and we also provide them with a medical physical once a year to make sure that they are medically sound based on requirements of the fire service. Rapid response. And they were here within five minutes five to ten minutes after the accident. So I thought that was pretty good. Gentlemen, watch the ice when you get out. You don't slide as it is. The fire department, like I said earlier, has a perception of only responding to fires, and that, that's just not the case. The fire department responds, the Garner Fire Department responds to over 5,000 calls a year. And those calls are anywhere from medical calls to wrecks, hazardous material, fires, uh, water problems, service conditions in houses. So what, when it comes to inclement weather or uh, a snow or ice storm, it is very important that we're prepared because uh, we work side by side with the Public Works Department and the Police Department to make sure that we can still provide service to every resident in our community even if uh, there is inclement weather and, and most people are asked to stay inside. So um, the preparedness that we do is, is done internally by our staff 
and then our external partners we work very well with in the community to, to meet their needs and to assist them whenever possible. Yeah, they, I, I felt they, uh, they handled things very well. I, mean, I, I have a few friends that are firemen, and, and I, I know it takes a lot of dedication to, to do this type of work, and especially in weather conditions like we're having today. You know, a lot of people don't think about that when it snows or ice or, or any kind of storm situation uh, where they're stuck at home, where they're on a two hour delay, told not to get on the road. Well, we still have to provide emergency services. People still get sick. People still get hurt. People still have motor vehicle accidents and homes still catch on fire. So yeah, we've got to be prepared to still respond in any condition whatsoever. Uh, so we do have inclement weather protocols uh, we are prepared to respond on uh, adverse road conditions. I'm, I've been on several incidents where we've had to cut trees out of our way just to make it uh, to a call, and we're prepared to do that. The stigma placed on firefighters is it's a bunch of guys sitting around the clubhouse playing checkers, waiting on something to catch on fire. And it's uh, certainly far from the truth. Um, our guys have a lot of things to do, and this stuff's done typically uh, during the day from eight to five. Um, a lot of chores. You know, the firehouse is our house away from home, and we want to keep it as maintained, as clean as possible. So every day firefighters clean this fire station and all four of them. Uh, from top to bottom, every toilet scrubbed, every floor is mopped. Um, the grass is cut you know, once a week, twice a week if needed. Um, so we, we pretty much do everything that you would do at home because this is our home. Um, and then also we've got tons of equipment that must be checked daily. You know, when, it, when an emergency call comes in, we've got to ensure that the equipment works. The rescue training today. Uh, Garner's been a rescue department for going on 15 years now, uh, and we went heavy rescue back in 2010, meaning we could do uh, heavy vehicle extrication. We got more equipment, more personnel. Um, we also took on water rescue and rope rescue, and today we're out doing our water rescue training. We acquired a boat uh, back in 2010. So we're out training on it today, the boat operations, uh, letting the guys get their hands on it and get some time on the boat. Uh, as part of the, the rescue certification we had, we took on water rescue, so we would be responsible if anything happened in our district or we were called out to another district. There is a, a rescue company that would be responsible for the boat, but at any given time, personnel could be asked to be on the boat, drive the boat, um, or man the boat, and we're all trained to that level, so we all require training on it. We got a call from the station saying that, you know, we had a trash can, a trash company with a with a can that was smoldering in the back of it, made it had some kind of small fire inside of it. Um, so generally, citizen complaints like that or citizen calls like that really aren't too emergent. So we went over, took a ride over there just to check it out, make sure everything was okay. It was uh, we had a burnt smell when we first got there, but the main concern was is they said they threw a gas grill in the back of it, and the concern with gas grills is they have a you know, that's extra fuel inside of what's already a bunch of junk inside of a big container. Um, so we were, we were investigating to make sure we had no kind of propane or anything like that leak inside the, of the, the truck before they proceeded on with the route to finish up or dump or anything like that. So um, that was kind of all the investigating we did. We took the thermal imaging camera and, uh, and went through to see if we had any active fire inside the machine that we couldn't see first because a lot of times you could have hidden fire in that in that stuff that you'll never see except you just might see a little bit of smoke so um, everything looked good from that standpoint uh, 
asking questions and investigating a little further, it's turned out they just threw a gas grill in there. There was no propane cylinder in there. So we wet down the material that had been smoldering a little bit more, and, and they went and dumped the uh, container at the dump. And the guy actually spoke to us afterwards and said they made it all right. So they came back and thanked us for it. I've always said if, if you call 911 and the 911 dispatcher doesn't know, who, doesn't know who to send, they send the fire department. We go to some crazy calls. I mean, you can't even think of some of the things we go to. Um, so basically, if you have a problem, we're there to hopefully try to solve the problem if it's an emergency situation. The department determined that we had a need to better prepare our future company officers to succeed in the department as they promote up through the ranks. Uh, so we witnessed the need and the battalion chiefs and the administration put together a, a class to help prepare those young guys that are moving up to assume that next role so that there's less of a learning phase or learning time before they can get their feet on the ground and go straight to running. And so whether they're just acting for the day because their company officer is out sick or if it's a long-term acting uh, because someone's injured or because they get promoted to that, that next level. You're going by now? Yeah, if there's no overhaul to be done, then go ahead and back down the steps. And what we've been doing in here is, um, you know, a crew will go in in the first division, which is downstairs, they'll search the rooms as they go in and knock the fire back and also protect the stairway so the next crew can go in and go upstairs and search division two. What you have is a, a, a large amount of gas with the LP tree on the downstairs and the upstairs then you have a little bit of gas that goes across the ceiling that would simulate a, a well-involved fire in that room. Uh, the Class A materials that they're burning in the other rooms give it the smoke and generate some heat so uh, their officers will res respond in on their apparatus and go ahead and size up the situation and make tactical decisions on what fire attack they'll, they'll use. We have a couple different methods that we use. One is the radio if, if there's going to be two instructors inside that will give a give a radio call out to actually ask for which prop they want the next way is that if the radio is tied up they can actually give us hand signals from the windows because all these windows and doors open for safety reasons so if the radio tends you know the radio traffic gets tied up they can actually give hand signals out the window um, there's also just a standard uh, light it up when they're going in and once I see the steam hit the fire or the, the, okay. the water hit the fire I'll see steam come out of the building and I'll know that they're in that room attacking the fire and I might just leave it on for you know 15 20 seconds and then cut it off if that's what they want so there's different methods but the, the standard method is just by the radio. The, the Wake County Fire Training Center is an excellent facility uh, it's one of the best training centers in the state of North Carolina if not the the, the most um, it has a very, very aggressive burn building. The, the, burn, the building itself has multiple props and it, it tries to keep it as realistic as possible. So the, the fire training center is very important to us as an organization and we try to utilize um, those resources that we can't provide internally by sending them to that training center. Your attack bumper would have your, his five inch rolled out to you, you're going to pull right in, hook into his five inch and give your water. And that, but here is a little bit different. We're gonna have to go three inch. Well, the volunteers it started back years ago. They're the backbone of the community, come breaking the fire department what it is today. They they work hard. They they come up. Another thing with the, we got men on duty here. These guys that are on volunteer now used to just live in our fire district, but we take them applications from all over the county now. And then when they come in like that to, to work, 
they have to work like a 24-hour shift or a 12-hour shift and, and meet certain criteria to be here each month. And they, they will sleep here at the fire stations. Our volunteer status right now, we have, uh, we have about 50 full-time firemen and then also we have uh, anywhere from 25 to 35 volunteers. And the volunteers really help a lot because when they, you have a major fire or something, they can come in and help relieve some of the stress on the other firemen and they also can, can help carry the load and, and save a lot of time for our, our full-time firemen. What, what, is, what is the voltage on most of our trucks as far as the generators at the, at the panels? 34. 220 volts. Yeah, 220, 221, whatever. 220, <laughs> 220 to 230. You probably see a lot of residue or moisture right here, power steering pump right here. These trucks have tags in them, got little yellow plates in them. If you look on there, it explain everything that goes in this truck. Power steering, a lot of them do transmission fluid. It'll be on that tag inside the truck. Tell you what Lieutenant Eason has a, a mechanical background, so he's very familiar with heavy equipment, uh, motors, things, things of that nature. And so anytime that we can do or make these repairs internally, it saves the taxpayers money on maintenance uh, without having to outsource a mechanic. One thing that the fire service sees, and this is a, a national trend, is the baby boomer generation, the, the generation that uh, came into the fire service with technical trades already in their pocket, they're retiring. So our, our younger dot-com generation typically comes from an educational or school setting with um, not a lot of trade backgrounds. So what we're seeing is we're, having, we're needing to train our, our newer generation of firemen how to properly check and maintain equipment. Uh, he may have told y'all the manifold on that side. Um, all these big clamps right here, it's not going to do it here, but on the other side where your turbo is, if it, this thing's not going to leak. This is where air is pulled into it. You'll see the black soot. Yeah, yeah. You'll see black soot spew all out, and you'll know that that clamp's leaking. And that's what Lieutenant Easton is doing is he is understanding the employees that we have now and how to build a, a future of maintenance and prevention. So he is showing them the, the true do's and don'ts and maintenance of what they use on a daily basis. including the driver. The driver, Captain Deitch, Matthew, and one more guy here in the back seat. You've got to want to help folks. You've got to want to be a part of something good. You know, this organization prides itself on being a, not only uh, an emergency service that provides help to all that's in need, but we, we're a big role in the community, a big part of this community. Um, so we want people that understand that and want to be a part of this organization. Fireman's Day is my most favorite event of the year. Um, it is our largest public safety, fire prevention, and education event. We are able to reach thousands of people that day and hopefully share not only what we do, but what, what we can teach to prevent fires in the future. We try to provide something for every person in the community where for the, for the kids we build a live burn prop where we show them what a real fire can do and how fast a real fire can grow. For the adult we try to show fire prevention education where they can see how to plan with their family on, on what to do if there is an emergency. Uh, we, we try to do community give back that day where we raise money 
Fireman's Day monies are raised to donate mainly towards the North Carolina J.C. Burns Center. So the, the monies that we raise on that Fire Prevention and Education Day, we give right back to the community. Uh, we, we buy Christmas presents and donations, we give donations to the J.C. Burns Center based on our success of Fireman's Day. And Fireman's Day grows every year. Um, the, the parade is a very traditional event, but then we also have gone to a more expo uh, festival type setting where we allow outside vendors to come in to hopefully draw more citizens to the event so we can share fire prevention education with them. he was backing into off of Highway 50, a car uh, ran into uh, the tractor trailer. And what resulted was the woman was pinned in her car where she couldn't get out. And we had to utilize our uh, technical rescue skills to stabilize the vehicle and remove that car away from her uh, by cutting the roof off, the doors off, and, and all that stuff. And it, the extrication uh, was very intense. It took a long time. So when that occurs, uh, we've got what we've, we've probably all heard of, the golden hour. She was a trauma patient and she needed to be at a trauma center within an hour. And we knew our extrication time was going to be extended. Uh, so we notified Wake Med that we needed the helicopter uh, to come to the scene. So when we did cut her out of the vehicle, we could load her into the helicopter and she was looking at a six minute ride to the hospital in that helicopter. Um, so yeah, we were, we're trained into creating landing zones and landing helicopters in a safe environment, and then we're trained to get that patient to the helicopter so they can take off and get them to a trauma center. Our members of the organization um, developed a mission statement and it's not something that I developed, it was something that the organization saw and, and their, what their quote is, is building our future on the foundation of our past and I think that's very important. Our fire department was built on aggressive firefighting and volunteerism and that is no different than the career staff of today. Uh, I stress aggressive, safe firefighting but they also volunteer their time even though it's a career, they're away from their families. They spend countless hours and holidays at a fire station. And so to make sure that we're upholding the traditions of the past, that's one job that I've been taxed with as the fire chief. Over the years, the population has grown, the area has grown, and with that growth comes more emergency responses. So the fire department certainly has to grow with it. I remember as a, as a kid riding my three-wheeler in the Fireman's Day Parade as a 10-year-old boy. And I have a 10-year-old boy now, and he rides his bicycle in that parade. So there are a lot of aspects that haven't changed, but yet so much has changed. 
and the community has grown so much for the positive, the same as the fire department. But what I think the fire department and the town has both got to do is we've got to remember those traditions that are important to defining who we really are 